Now kicking off our list at number 10, the boot. Anything that starts with a the, it's bad news right there. Oversized boots made of iron or copper, these are a little different than Uggs, pay attention. These boots were often brazed onto the floor, so the accused, well, ideally they couldn't move around anywhere at all. Most of the time they were just sitting upright, they were stuck, it was welded to the ground. The boots at this time were filled with boiling water or molten lead, both pretty bad. And from that point on, well, it's not gonna be great. You're probably not gonna survive. Another medieval punishment involving boots, which is somehow worse, in my opinion, was first seen in Ireland. They were lightweight metal boots that were filled with water and then heated over a fire until the water was boiling, as well as your feet. I don't know, comment down below, which is worse? To me, the second one is way worse. I don't like a slow boil, I don't like that. A watched pot never boils, maybe that trick will work, who knows? Number nine, the iron chair. Not to be confused with the Iron Throne, although I'm sure that one wasn't too comfortable to sit on. Just a chair of swords. The Iron Chair has spikes covering the back, all along the armrests, the seat. There's spikes, there's spikes everywhere. It's dangerous. 500 to 1500 rusty spikes on average per chair. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of welding work. Oh my gosh. The victim's wrists were tied to the chair, of course, because you'll want to get off of it immediately. Now that's bad enough, being stuck sitting on this chair, but some variants got creative and made it even somehow worse. Some variants of the iron chair had holes underneath the chair's bottom, and that's where red hot coals would be placed to cause you severe burns. It's like from Casino Royale, only a lot, lot worse. Sometimes weights would even be added, making matters much worse. Now this chair was meant to get a confession out of the accused because although it sounds quite fatal, no spikes could actually penetrate a vital organ and wounds were closed immediately by the spikes themselves. Sounds awful, but it wasn't the worst. I mean, it is, but you know what I mean. You didn't die all the time. Number eight, coffins. I'm not talking about, you know, these types of coffins with vampires like, you know, coffins you bury in the ground. That would be a bad way to go out, no doubt about it. But this coffin that I'm talking about much, much worse. Here, the victim was placed up high, not down below. They were placed up high in a cage that was so small, you could barely fit inside of it. Stuck in one spot, usually with limbs sticking out. The live victim was most of the time left to starve or die of thirst or exposure. Yeah, those limbs sticking out, insects, the sun all day, it doesn't matter what you get at this point, but it's slow and it's gonna suck. And of course, in medieval fashion, it's gonna be quite public. Everyone's not working, no one has jobs in medieval times, we're all just watching some guy stuck in a cage, we're like, sure, this is it, we're living. UFC. Number seven, the instep borer. We'll start at the feet and we'll make our way up to the body, why not? The instep borer was a medieval German punishment instrument. Again, quite creative, these medieval folks. This iron boot was much more mobile than the last pair of boots, that one for sure. See, this was just one shoe, rather. A shoe that hinged open to allow your foot to slide in. And then from then on out, just trouble. Slow chaos. A crank would protrude out of the top of the foot, and if you were to turn said crank slowly, well, on the inside of this iron shoe was a thick serrated iron blade, cutting deeper and deeper with each rotation of the crank. This location of this crank was purposeful because most of the time, the accused would bleed out fast. No recovering from that one. Still better than Uggs, in my opinion, but whatever. Number six. Branks. Ah, the branks. Here we go. Sounds horrible. Branks were used to punish nagging wives, or slandering wives, or cursing wives, or women who performed or practiced witchcraft. If you criticize Christianity, love it. But if you had an opinion or you can do math, you get the branks pretty much. It was horrible. A scold's bridle, or branks, much more fun to say, was a device usually reserved for women. Yeah, classic medieval times history. It wasn't just a muzzle either. We always look at it as if it was a muzzle. No, it was a lot worse than that. It was a cage for the head with an iron plate projecting into the mouth, even pressing down on top of the tongue. More often than not, this plate was studded with spikes so that if the tongue moved at all, ergo, if you were to speak, it would cause you to bleed out. Now again, you can't open your mouth with this device, so that is double trouble. It was first seen in Scotland back in 1567 and later used in England. Branks were commonly used, again, on women, of the lower classes whose speech was troublesome. Yeah, what does it even mean, right? Some shaped like an animal's head, so you'd have a cow for somebody that was considered lazy, a donkey for someone considered a fool, a hare for an eavesdropper, or a pig for a glutton. Yeah, God forbid you had an opinion in the dark ages. Number five, denailing. <sighs> okay, the forcible extraction of one's fingernails or toenails or both, lovely. Hey, before we move on, let's give that thumbs up a click. Yeah, the little thumbnail right there that we see on the screen. Let's spread a little positivity into this list. I need it, I don't know, I feel like you need it as well. Thank you so much, back to denailing. This was a favorite method of medieval punishment because, well, 
Sounds horrible, but it was easy. You just needed a really strong guy and some medieval pliers and, well, Bob's your uncle. You're getting the confession. A variant used in medieval Spain introduced a sharp wedge of wood underneath the flesh and in between the actual nail itself which is horrible. The wedge was then slowly hammered into this grove more and more until the nail popped off. Yeah, thumbs up for thumbnails popping off in history. We try here on B. Number four, Dimnaccio ad bestias, also known as killing by wild animals. I'm a dog lover too, I can't read this one. Dimnaccio ad bestias was a form of Roman capital punishment in which the accused was killed by wild animals in the arena. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, oh, kind of similar to Gladiator and what they had to do. No, this was much sooner. This was a little different. This was 80 years sooner. Now, at this point, and Gladiator, they could defend themselves to some degree. Those meeting their fate with this method, they were always defenseless, and sometimes tied to one spot. Or they were given a small weapon made of wood. It was an insult, really, no chance of surviving. This form of punishment was seen in ancient Rome starting around the second century BC, but 80 or so years later, the Colosseum then saw a similar practice. Only then it was public viewing, it was a big spectacle, it was an event, and most importantly, gladiators could fight back with tridents or nets. Both are horrible. I'd rather just get it done with, to be honest. I'm not fighting a lion. No way. Look at me. I'm like 110 pounds soaking wet. I'm not gonna fight. I'll fight a zebra, maybe. I'll fight like an emu. I could probably take an emu. Number three, hanging. Again, a little straightforward, but I'll try and provide some history for this one. Sure, some hanging history. Okay, ugh. Hanging is quick. I mean, that's when it's supposed to be. Hanging can be one of two ways. Suspension by the limbs as a form of punishment or hanging by the neck as a form of capital punishment. We don't often think about the first version. Being strung up by an arm, that's gotta suck. That's pretty uncomfortable. I can't even raise my arm in class for longer than five minutes. I gotta switch it up. Know what I mean? These shoulders are weak. Strapado, oh, this would have been a nightmare. Strapado was the form in which your wrists were tied behind your head, eventually causing your shoulders to dislocate. I don't know what's worse out of all three of those. They all suck. I would do the get it done with, honestly. I don't want to live for any of this. Number two, rats. If you're a rat lover, this one's gonna suck. I know some people have rats. They like to do tricks and crawl around their neck and in their mouths. That's cool. I'm not a rat guy myself, but don't knock it till I try it. Rat punishment originated in ancient Rome, and ever since then, it unfortunately has been part of the most horrible, gruesome punishments every era past. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something, and then a metal bin or an enclosure, a bucket of some sort, strapped to his abdomen or his chest. Now, inside this enclosure, there are rats, which the strapped down person can definitely feel walking and sniffing around on your bare skin. Now this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure. Historically, hot coals were usually placed on top, which of course very quickly creates a bad hot environment for these rats inside. Now from here, these rats begin to panic, right? They frantically search for a way out, any way out, because like us, they have survival instincts. Metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh is not. You can probably eat your Way through that. You can see where this is going and you probably just went <gasps> at your computer. Yeah, there we go. Now you get it. Let's move on. Poor rats as well, right? Like, come on, those little animals, they don't want to do that. They don't want to eat a six pack today. I don't want that. Finally, number one, the rack. The rack was a device that was made out of a wooden rectangle as a frame. You've probably seen this in Game of Thrones and that's about it. The person being punished here would have their limbs attached to the four sides with chains and then the people doing the punishing with the helps of rollers and pulleys and a couple of very strong, very strong guys. They would stretch out the person until either the limbs were torn clean off from the body or they got pulled out from their sockets and then couldn't be used anymore. As I'm saying this, I want to faint. This is so horrible. I said I felt lightheaded typing this up. This is really bad. Imagine being around in a time where people actually used to do this and you didn't just watch it on Game of Thrones for 12 bucks a month. And again, more often than not, it was public. So embarrassing watching your shoulder get popped out. You're like, oh, just stop. Number 10 is got your nose and your ears and a couple other limbs because ancient civilization globally shared the unique agreement in the removal of someone's nose, ears, or both as the punishment for a crime. Tokugawa era Japan is no different. While flogging was a common penalty for crimes such as thefts, fighting, public intoxication, etc., amputation of the nose or ears or both replaced flogging as a penalty very early in this time, which it didn't last. This period of Japan follows a particularly violent one, and in the time of Tokugawa, they repealed a lot and calmed a lot of the criminal punishment laws from before. Regardless, commit the crime and pay the fine with mutilation. People who experienced this punishment were socially marked for their crime and were banished from hiding it. No big deal for those who had already been punished with X 
exile in accompaniment of mutilation of their nose and ears. Female culprits of crimes that were punishable with mutilation, however, were never mutilated, but they were ordered to parade through the village naked. So I mean, pick your poison. Speaking of a woman having to pick her poison, number nine is the tobacco ordeal. This is one of the most fascinating trial and ordeal ordeals that I have come across in my time researching. While there isn't much information, what little there is is unique to say the least. So a woman who has committed a crime goes through trial and ordeal the way that a man would, but often has different and less visceral ordeals. A favored way was the tobacco ordeal. A woman would be made to smoke several pipes full of tobacco and the ash of the pipe was to be put into a cup of water as she did. No ash was to be spilled anywhere but the cup. This water and ash combo would be mixed together by a finger or spoon and once the woman has finished her appointed number of pipes, she would have to drink the full cup of water. It was believed any woman who could smoke the tobacco and drink the ash water without feeling sick or dizzy was an innocent woman. Anyone who could not was guilty. Guilty of being a normal person because who is drinking out of an ash cup and not feeling like death after? But anyways. Number eight is the world's uncoolest face tat. Your parents could be disappointed about that face tat you chose, but imagine how much more disappointed they would have been if it was a government issued one smack dab in the center of your forehead. Tattooing in Japan can be traced back to 14,000 BC to 300 AD, when they were believed to hold a mystical significance. Afterwards, the culture moved away from tattoos well until the Edo period, where it came back in a very different way. For some duration of the time, a stamp like forehead tattoo was the go to punishment for a non violent offender, like a thief, a loiterer, a vandal, whatever. It was classified as a type of corporal punishment like flogging was. Now, usually it came with expulsion, which unlike exile doesn't kick you from the whole town, but it can kick you from your previous neighborhood. It was a fantastic record keeping tab, however, as the tattoos were chosen by each region and was unique to them, making criminals from other areas identifiable. In most societies, if a tattooed criminal re offended, they did receive the death penalty. However, some of the civilizations had three strikes then you're out system. In 1745 tattooing replaced the previously discussed facial mutilation as society became gentler and less bloodthirsty. This continued over the years with face tattooing changing to the less embarrassing and quite fashionable by today's standards arm tattoo. In 1872 the newly established government of Japan abolished the tattoo penalty for once and all. Let's get uncomfortable with number seven, the steak ordeal. This fun ordeal starts with two large vertical stakes driven into the ground. On one of Tokugawa's three execution grounds. There would be multiple sets of these stakes depending on the height and weight of accused facing the stakes. This is because the body was to be stretched taunt between the two stakes tied by the wrist and the ankle joints. They start with the wrist to, sus to suspend the body and make it easier to tie the ankles, but once the victim was up on those stakes, their weight was all on them. Anyone tied up in this torturous fashion was forced to remain this way until they either confessed or, well, died somehow. Hanging by the hair of the head was another staking ordeal. Obviously this wasn't something doable for someone without long hair, but worry not as long hair was cultivated between both sexes so there was never any shortage of torture options. While held aloft by two others, someone would tie the victim's long hair into a knot at the top of the stake frame. So once they're tied, they let the weight of the person all hang from that hair until they confessed or something uncomfortable to imagine happens. So number six is going to make me even more nauseous, it's tendon cutting. This makes me very squeamish, I'm gonna go fast. A customary punishment before and during the Edo was to cut the Achilles tendon of both feet. This was to maim a person for the rest of their life. No hunting, no working, heck it couldn't walk in most cases, and you lost muscle connectivity that even aided in hip motion. This punishment makes you depend solely on others for the necessity of life. Seeing as this was usually a punishment for manslaughter or a passion killing, your family would have very likely disowned you anyways, leaving you alone to figure this out. One documented account is of an old man who had to move his body by dragging his legs using his hands and carrying two small blocks of wood in each to protect them as he did. If your tendons were spared, it was only to be exiled from your home and city forever or to be executed. Anatsurushi is number five. The Japanese were incredibly determined to keep Christian colonialists out of their nation. They represented imperialism and they were known to be dangerous outsiders, bringing foreign diseases and unnecessary wars in politics. Essentially, they didn't come 
quietly, they came quite noisily and bossily, and the Japanese just weren't feeling that. Now, the method they chose actually turned out to be incredibly effective and withheld Christianity from the country for far longer than many others had. This is because it was a wildly brutal method. Anatsurushi was used in the 17th century to coerce Christians to recant their faith after entering Japan. Victims would be hung upside down, suspended by their feet, and often lowered into a hole, itself often filled with excrement at the bottom. A cut would be made in the forehead around the temple area in order to let the blood pressure decrease in the area around their head. The aim was to break their resolve, to renounce their faith, or they would eventually die. For this reason, one of their hands would be left free and exposed so they may signal upwards a willingness to recant. Both Japanese and Western Christians are known to have been submitted to this torture. Sometimes there was a doctor around just to resuscitate them so they can continue being tortured. They were also subjected to head down crucifixion and water crucifixion. Water style was carried out by putting an upside down cross at the shoreline low enough at the tide at low tide and waiting for the tide to rise so that the person would eventually drown. Christians were treated this way until 1873 when Christianity was finally allowed into Japan. And since we're already on the topic, number four is crucifixion. While it's unclear when crucifixion was introduced into Japan, likely 12th to 16th century, it had already had a 2,000 year history when that when they did. So the Japanese added some of their own twists to it, as you heard previously with the mention of an upside down or a water crucifixion. It was one of the three executions reserved for the worst of offenders. Alongside beheading and hanging, sometimes the three punishments would be mixed and matched. For example, crimes against individuals of higher social status and against family members or one's master could result in beheading prior to crucifixion. Adultery, theft, and subterfuge are all crucible offenses as they threatened both the social and political order. The person to be crucified would be carried out on horseback nude, a lot adding to the humiliation of their sentence. He'd be poked and prodded with staffs by the assigned guards who would also carry a large banner with the person's name, offense, and punishment. Oh yeah, they aired your dirty laundry on the march to your grave. This route would also be set to pass the accused residence as well as the location of their crime scene. The accused was then tied at the execution site, and when the cross was risen and mounted with the accused tied upon it, the guards used their staffs to spear him repeatedly until a final thrust to the throat for an ending blow. The boiling point is number three. Large cauldrons were used by the Japanese for boiling fish to retrieve oil, preparing rice, soups, and cooking people alive. This particular torture was a remnant of the warring states period that I've mentioned to come before Tokugawa. They were completely masochismic in that time period. The Tokugawa empire saw that and ended quite a few of these punishments because of it. But not at first. This is why I can tell you how the Tokugawa would fill these jumbo sized cauldrons with cold water and put it over a blazing fire. As the water began to warm, the accused would be told hop on in. What starts as an arguably nice toasty bath begins to boil. The accused is to remain in hot water until they confessed. Now this was only used as an ordeal when the judge and jury were very convinced of a person's guilt, but the person just wasn't fessing up. It could sometimes also constitute as a mode of punishment or execution. For example, an entire family in the 16th century were boiled alive in a gigantic bathtub as a punishment for a failed assassination. Another fun ordeal was using a pan of boiling water and having the accused dip their arm into it. If they refused to do it, they were assumed guilty. If they didn't got burned, they were also assumed guilty. Only if you could stick your arm in boiling water and come out unscathed are you innocent, because that makes sense. Number two, we pull the saw, or don't. Don't will sound better in a second. So like a few others on this list, the Tokugawa's let this torturous execution method from the past dynasty enter into theirs. However, they made some changes in the brutality of it. But before this change, this execution method allowed for an interactive experience. So step right up boys and girls, who is twisted enough to slowly saw at the head of a man buried alive? In a book by Louis Freud regarding Japanese history, he describes the grisly execution of a samurai slash bounty hunter. The man had attempted to claim a bounty target, but missed his shot. While he had escaped, it wasn't for long. He was captured and identified, and he was sentenced to the pulling the saw. The man had been buried up to his neck, and a saw set up next to him, with the signboard inviting passerbys to cut at his neck, slowly hacking the men's head off alive. Now traditionally this saw is also placed close enough to the victim's throat that the accused, while buried alive, could make the decision to speed up the process if they really wanted to. But like I said, changes were made. Metal saws, they were replaced with bamboo ones, and rather than being used to actually saw off the living's heads as they once were, they were now simply put on public display next to the condemned person for periods of days prior to their execution by other means. 
Orleans. And number one is the painful honor seppuku, which literally translates means self-disembowelment. So before I unpack that statement, there are two forms of this execution, voluntary and obligatory. Voluntary is pretty rare. Circumstances such as warriors defeated in battle awaiting execution by their enemies and not wanting the dishonor of that. Meanwhile, obligatory seppuku refers to the method of capital punishment for samurai to spare them the disgrace of being beheaded by a common executioner. This form of execution was ritualized as a result. Great emphasis is put on the proper performance of the ritual. It's to be carried out in the presence of one or more witnesses sent by an authority who had ha issued the execution. While kneeling, the samurai would take a small dagger or short sword from a small table placed before him. The proper method, developed over several centuries, was plunging this weapon into your left abdomen, drawing the blade up laterally to the right and then turning it upwards. A truly exemplary samurai would then remove the blade and push it into his sternum across the first cut and then up to pierce the throat. This is a brutally painful and extremely slow death to experience. Weirdly, for this twisted reason, it was favored by the warrior code used by the samurai as an effective way to demonstrate the courage, self-control, and strong resolve of the samurai and to prove the sincerity of purpose even when facing their own crimes. Women of the samurai class also committed ritual takings of lives, but instead of slicing the abdomen, they slashed their throat with a short sword or dagger. A little easier on the girlies, I guess. Kicking off the list at number 10. Boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man. Trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, molten metal. This was another form of capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number eight, the rack. Onto something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, this is a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well, and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. They would just leave you hanging by these ropes, and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable, honestly. Hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done. Number seven, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally 
toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court, and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then, folks. Number six, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead, and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random times so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number five, keel hauling. Not to be confused with kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles. Then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot, it's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. Some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were number three rats another game of thrones classic if you're a rat person i know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat that's cool but maybe cover stuart little's eyes for this one rats as a medieval punishment where do i even start okay this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time what was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach now inside this metal enclosure there's rats which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them the little feet walking around in their skin and this is when the person and still in the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure historically it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside from there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin, and then that, they can obviously bite through. So you can paint the picture in your head, it's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost, just lying there, where somebody is then tied to it, and everybody else just hammers them and beats the out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do. Straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull, and basically, it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big closed cauldron, and usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one, when it's in the movie Saw. 
So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bowl and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bowl so that when somebody screamed it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? I'm learning so much about history that's fun on Bumblebee and I hope you are too. If a part two is in your deepest desires, hit that thumbs up and I'll come back and throw up a few times and talk some more smack. Starting our list off at number 10, trial by elephants. Yeah, we'll start with animals. You know what? I love animals. Why not? First of all, I'm not sure if you've ever seen an elephant in real life before, but these things are mightier than you can ever imagine. They're gorgeous animals, but they're incredibly dangerous to be near. Their foot is like... It's massive, it's like a huge tree stump, it's insane. For this punishment, we have to head to a place, of course, where elephants can be found. That's probably a promising start. South and Southeast Asia. Elephants have been trained for years to trample the accused. Now, depending on which elephant you get in this horrible, horrible demise, they were trained to either get the job done fast or slow. Yeah, imagine an elephant getting the job done quickly. Sounds like something you'd never want to witness for yourself, right? Wrong. No, these punishments were all public. It was almost like a show, like ancient Romans Colosseum. We think of that and we think of lions and we're like, wow, that must have been terrifying. Yeah, imagine that, but now it's an elephant with a big floppy nose too, really loud. They're loud, that's a scary way to go. But at least that's a quick way to go, unlike this next one here. Number nine, strapado. Strapado sounds like an Italian artist. It's for sure not. It's definitely not an artist, no. It's creative, again, I'll admit, but in the worst ways. It's an uncomfortable form of punishment, unlike others on this list. It doesn't necessarily always end in death. In Strapado, the guilty is strung up by their wrists behind their head. Now, at first, this doesn't sound too bad, but Again, just wait. The awkward angle is pretty much guaranteed to cause dislocation of the shoulders. But if that doesn't really kill you, weights may be added. And then at that point, your body's not gonna recover. Thought to have originated in medieval times, of course, always medieval times, could have guessed that one. During the Inquisition, Trapado has been used, sadly, into the 21st century. I don't know what they do in UFC, but there's probably a little bit Strapado going on there. A little arm bar Strapado? No, no thanks. Number eight, drawing and quartering. You know you're screwed when there's an and, drawing and quartering. Wait, there's more. This is one of the most infamous methods of punishments. Now this punishment was first doled out in England back in the 13th century. Now the accused was of course, as you'd guess, drawn or tied to a horse and then dwelt, dragged to the gallows. And then at that point they would usually be hanged, maybe disemboweled, maybe beheaded, maybe be withered. I don't know, other words that start with B, that's pretty horrible. Afterwards, the guilty was of course, as you guessed, quartered. In other words, he had his body split into different parts, you know. Some, sometimes each limb would be tied to a different horse and they'd have them run in different directions. It was creative, if I'm being honest, a little bit creative. The choreography, the timing here, it was impeccable. This punishment was reserved for those guilty of treason and was thankfully abolished back in 1867. So no more horses involved, poor animals. Number seven, molten metal. I don't have to explain this one. This is, you've seen Game of Thrones. This is the worst. This should have been number one maybe. I don't know, I'm guessing myself right now. This skin crawling punishment was a form of capital punishment because, well, yeah, there's no way you're gonna bounce back from this. While gruesome, this punishment has a fairly simple explanation. They would just pour molten metal or something extremely hot and not great down the accused throat. I'll, I'll tell you what, that's that's probably gonna do the trick. At least it's gonna be fast, right? In Game of Thrones, it was pretty fast. There was like three minutes left in the episode. Guy did it, boom, roll credits. That's fine, that's a good way to go. Beats elephants, in my humble opinion. Usually during this punishment, they would do things to ensure that your throat would stay open during the pouring of the hot, hot metal. And to that, I have to ask, does that even matter at this point? Put on my face, my back, my feet, either way, I'm fainting and I'm not waking up. Sounds like that show Uh-Oh from the 90s. Just dumping things. I don't want anything dumped on me. Milk, molten metal, rats, nothing. Number six, keel hauling. As somebody who's not a fan of water, this type of punishment, I can't even imagine. I wouldn't even get on the boat to begin with. Already scary. It sounds like something from Game of Thrones and it can vary depending on how bad the ocean or the boat is. Imagine that as a lead up. Yeah, the ocean looks pretty rough today. Maybe you'll make it. This punishment was reserved, of course, for sailors. Sailors at sea couple of naughty mateys. Now, it was first performed by the Dutch Navy back in the late 16th century, and what would happen was, well, the accused, they would be tied with a rope and then dragged underwater from one end of a ship all the way to the other, around the rudder, around all that bad shit down there. And while many died, obviously, being flossed around a pirate ship covered in barnacles, it wasn't always fatal, if you can believe that. Not always, but a good amount of time, definitely. Yeah, you're not coming back from that. I can't even hold my breath for that long, no way. Number five, sawing. 
Yeah, sawing. You know, again, another one I don't have to explain too much here, hopefully. Mostly seen in Rome, Spain, and some portions of Asia. It's common, it's a pretty common straightforward idea, sawing is. You can imagine this one already, right? We sure hope you can because, well, we can't show it. Of course. This is another straightforward one, unfortunately. Capital punishment at its cruelest. Getting sawed in half. Again, to the public. Yeah, here's a fun one. Here's a fun show. Drive-in movies or sawing? I'm not sure. Here's a fact that some folk don't quite realize. This one sends shivers down my spine. But sometimes the sawing was done from top to bottom, not side to side. It's almost impressive, right? It's like cutting a carrot in half vertically. It's a little awkward. It's rolling around a bit. But you know what? They did it. Somehow through bones and your soul. Mozzatello, occasionally used by the papal states for only some of the most, you know, terrible crimes or crimes that were considered bad at the time. Basically, the person who was being taken care of, they would be led to a scaffold that was located again in the public square, classic. Everyone come on out, grab your family, your aunts, your uncles, we're watching something today, classic. This person would be accompanied by a priest and on the scaffold would lie a coffin. How fitting, a coffin and of course, a masked executioner who is dressed in all black with the zipper mouth probably, I don't know. A prayer would be said for the soul that condemned, because I mean, sure, everyone's watching, like, oh yes, of course. And then when that time came, the executioner would swing a mallet into the air and then bring it down on the head of the prisoner. Now, sometimes, and hopefully this one blow would be enough to take their lives, and sometimes it would just render them unconscious, which would then lead them to their throat being, you know, you get it. None of these sound great, but this one, it sucks really bad. It's like, hey, you're gonna get hit, and then it might get worse, I don't know. Necklacing. I'm never wearing my necklace ever again. Here we go. Necklacing is a terrifying practice that involves a rubber tire, not a necklace, a rubber tire, and unfortunately, it involves a human being as well. The rubber tire is filled with petrol, which is then put around the victim's chest and arms, and they can't move, and then after that, they are set ablaze. Yeah, you figured that was coming. You think I'm talking about the hills have eyes or something terrible, but no, this was real life. I mean, I'm sure you can figure out what happens next, but this method, sadly, can take up to 20 minutes for somebody to pass away from. Little different than the elephant stuff, you know what I mean? They're just left suffering the whole entire time. This one wasn't too public. Nobody could stick around for this one. Cause you know, 20 minutes, no way. I could barely get through a 10 minute YouTube video. You wanna watch this guy burn for 20 minutes? Good joke, how horrible. Impalement. This was another one that was highly requested by you guys. I've heard you comment on this a couple times. So yeah, I'll talk about it, sure, you weirdos. Impaling, do impaling, long neck, impaling. I'm like, you got it. I hear ya, I see ya, let's make it happen. Vlad the Third, also known as Vlad the Impaler or something like that. He liked doing a little bit of something like this. This was a popular form a punishment for a very long time, sadly, and was most commonly used as a response to crimes against the state. Although Mr. Vlad, we just mentioned, basically did it to everybody that he didn't like, so I suppose to each their own. Sure. All right, Vlad the Third. Maybe Vlad the Fourth won't do that. Let's hope. Impalement was a method of both torture and obviously execution that involved, well, just slowly driving a stake or a pole or a spear or a big carrot, something pointy or whatever, through a person in order to completely or partially um, perforate their torso. There we go, I sound like a Victorian scientist. You can impale somebody vertically or again, horizontally, if you wanna spice it up. Instead of going this way, you go, oh, that's really bad. Ducking stools. Medieval times, here we go. If you can do math, you're going for a swim. This was a punishment used in the 16th and 17th century in England and New England. And it was uh, usually a punishment that was reserved for women. Women who uh, could do bed mass. There you go, you're a witch. Have a, have a nice dip. This punishment was given to a woman for doing what was considered unwomanly things. Back then, whatever that was supposed to mean. And it was ridiculous. Apparently this included things like having an argument with their husband, taking a dip, fighting with the neighbors, you're going for a swim. Gossiping and backstabbing, how dare thee, you're going swimming. Whoever made these rules clearly had never met a man or a friend because newsflash, everyone does all those things. I did all those before I even came in here to film, so hopefully I don't get dunked in the river. But basically this punishment would see a woman being tied up to a stool and then dropped into a lake or stream over and over again while a bunch of dudes with no teeth watched and they're like, yeah, that's what you get for being smart. And Talking back with your opinions on International Women's Day. We're posting this one too, eh? How ironic is that? First up is probably the least horrible you could get, galley labor. And while it wasn't traditional in Islamic law, corvi or galley labor was introduced into the Ottoman labor system over the course of the 16th century in response to the growing manpower needs of the navy and city construction. These sentences were granted for a wide variety of offenses, including theft, atheism, drunkenness, homicide, sexual employment, forced intercourse, bribery, 
documentary Document Foraging. The list goes on. A sentence was never under a year, but usually an average of eight. Apart from the offenses mentioned above, galley sentences could be issued in lieu of other sentences if there's a demand for rowers from the imperial or local fleets, meaning the manpower needed for the navy could sometimes override a decision of execution or imprisonment, or even take death row prisoners to sea with them. The catch was that most sentences did not specify the time a criminal had to serve. It was left to the ship admiral or captain to release prisoners when and where he chose. So sometimes when a captain was convinced that the convict had reformed himself, but he needed all the hands on deck available, well, you're not going anywhere. You could quite literally be worked to death. It was just as true for the Ottoman as it was for the Habsburg government then that it used galley sentences to enforce social control, even if the proportion of convicts in the Ottoman navy never reached the levels of the Spanish fleet. The grim reality of the penal system subordinated to the demands of imperial projects is that what separated life and death for someone was often whether they were physically fit enough to pull an oar. Next up is gonna sting, it's a kerbash. This follows galley and corvee labor because it was commonly used on the convicts discussed above. A kerbash is a strap style whip that averages a yard in length. Traditionally, they were made of hippo or rhino leather and was used as a punishment and torture instrument. And the state loved these things. They were widely employed by officials for various purposes of the state, including the obtaining of confessions from criminals, the collection of taxes, and the enforcement of corvee and galley labor. In the interest of maintaining agricultural productivity and increasing state revenue, we saw the use of corvee labor, which was crop and construction version of galley labor. It was a common practice for the foremen to enforce this type of labor by applying a whip on the fellahin, which is the name for those criminals. This whip, made of particularly strong but dry leather, was said to be able to peel the skin off in sheets from its blows. If a trained hand wielded this against you, bones could break and skin could blister and even get friction burns. Part of the comfortable use was that it was codified in the Kanon a the 1830 set of codes that dealt with crime and punishment. Within 55 articles dealing with offenses related to land cultivation, damages to public property, the offenses by public employees, 26 articles prescribe the use of a kerbash as punishment. A kerbash was sometimes an instrument used in our next punishment, foot whipping. Also called falanga or falaka. One of the best examples I can think of in media is actually the second season of Criminal Minds, when Spencer Reed is taken hostage by a religion crazed killer who tortures him with this method. Unlike most types of flogging, it is meant to be more painful than cause any actual injury to the victim. The received person is forced to be barefoot so that the soles of the feet are exposed. Ottoman falaka method has the victim also lie on their back with their feet elevated and bound. The underside arc of the feet are then repeatedly whipped. Falaka is usually carried out with a rigid and often heavy stick. It accordingly causes blunt trauma, leaving the person unable to walk and often impeded even for life. The Ottoman version causes more serious injuries than any other because of how the victims are bound. The person undergoing the falaka can twitch and struggle to a certain degree, and as a result, the stroke can land more randomly and can strike more injury prone areas of the foot. The toes and feet bones will break, as will the shins. And then shin splints were also a side effect, and some people experience knee displacement as well. The immediate experience of pain is described as stinging and searing. The subsequent pain from the succession of strokes is often described as throbbing, piercing, and burning, followed by fainting. Next up is swimming sacks, and not like an oversized ugly bathing suit, although we've all had one of those and it generally does feel like you're swimming in a sack. Anyways, a common execution for women, when they were executed, was being condemned into weighted sacks and dropped into the Bafora Sea. A story remains of how Sultan Ibrahim once executed his entire harem this way. Apparently one member had slept with another man, or Ibrahim simply wanted to noob ladies to pick from. Either way, 280 women were rounded up and put into weighted sacks that were tied shut around their necks. The reason we know this story is one of them apparently lived to tell the tale. Raising eyebrows in Western Europe when her rescue by a French ship became a public sensation and her story swept newspapers. Hadud crime and punishment is next on our list. Not all of these are found in the Ottoman history, as there's some back and forth between the powers that be in the ways of religion. However, there are accounts of Hadud crimes being punished in Hadud fashions. Early Muslim jurists inherited the concept of a category of crimes called Hadud from references to it made by the Prophet. Their scholars agree that Hadud includes a multitude of crimes, including adultery, consuming intoxicants, false fornication accusations, some theft, armed robbery, or banditry. These are considered violations of the rights of God and human rights. These punishments are specified in the Quran and they're doled out differently each time. For example, adultery holds a punishment of a hundred lashes, which would be done with a kibosh. And if one or both parties were single, they should also have a year of exile. A thief should have their hands cut off as a deterrent for further thievery. And someone who accuses someone else of adultery better have 
four witnesses alongside them. If they can't provide witnesses, they get 80 lashes and will never have their testimony accepted ever again. The Ottoman Empire was known for the removal of thieves' hands and sometimes feet, but also doled out amputation punishment for a few other crimes, such as disloyalty and perjury. And speaking of amputations, the classic rhinotomy is back. When is it not though? Pretty much every historical society was chopping off noses for some reason or another. This is because a mutilation of the extruding facial parts, so nose, ears, and lips, had detrimental effects on sensory, but it was also a permanent alteration of the most expressive parts of the human body. Rhinotomy was practiced by Greeks, Indians, Romans, Byazantines, Chinese peoples, and so on. While it was more prevalent in the Byazantines than the Ottomans, it didn't change the fact that an unfaithful woman was subjected to it while the man could get away with just a flogging. The Ottomans and Byazantines also have documented history of having the husband of an unfaithful woman be forced to commit the mutilation. You're already heartbroken, she cheated, now you gotta cut her face open too. Hard day for those guys. It also established rhinotomy as a punishment for Christian women who had consensual sexual relations with a Muslim man, or a Muslim woman who had consensual sexual relations with a Christian man. Chop chop with the chop chopping guys, it's time to be flayed alive. All the nausea for this one. Flaying a person alive has been employed as a method of execution in different parts of the world for many centuries, including ancient Rome, medieval England, and the Ottoman Empire. The process of flaying someone starts with stripping the clothes of a victim and tying them suspended by the wrist and ankle. They always started with the scalp and the head as it inflicted the most suffering and you wanted them to still be alive for that part. Then making incisions vertically down the body, following the legs, buttocks, and torso, they would peel back and remove the skin as intact as possible. In some instances, parts of the person's body were even boiled to make the skin softer and easier to remove. So that's two for one torture right there. There were a few ways you could die from flaying, but never from flaying itself. Shock, blood or fluid loss, hypothermia or infection are some potentials. The time of death could also be anywhere between a few hours and a few days. In the aftermath, many of these corpses would be hung on stakes for their display, their skin either discarded or hung up beside them. And speaking of, our next brutal punishment is impalement. While Vlad Sepes, aka Dracula, is famous for this torture, he actually learned it from the Turkish while held in captivity and tortured for his own homosexuality. With stake impalement, a victim's back door is forced down on the tip of a long, sharp, greased up stake. This starts the impalement process. The stake is then hoisted up and the body weight of the victim on the grease pole would slowly slide them downwards. The pole would travel up the intestinal opening and up through the body very, very slowly. It was a brutal, slow, and agonizing death, and it was one that could take days. Sometimes the Ottomans would flay someone before impalement. Gaunching was another type of brutal impaled death. The victim would be quite literally thrown onto metal spikes, hooks, or rods, and then left to die on them. These hooks and spikes could be found over the edges of certain palace balconies. Gentlemen, tune out and don't say I didn't warn you. The next is the sack squish. According to the 1622 Contemporary Chronicles, the teenage Sultan Osman II suffered an excruciating death by compression of, well, his boys, by assassin known as Pevlian the Oil Wrestler. That's right, an oil wrestler crushed his scrote till he died. Wild. Sack crushing is a punishment that was performed as slowly as possible to worsen the intensity of a victim's agony and lengthen its duration. And it was often performed by a vice that would make them burst from the inside and then crunch the spermatic cord with a plier-like attachment. This victim was usually held upside down while this occurred so that they're unable to pass out or enter a state of shock while the torture occurs. This was also because the condemned usually was vomiting repeatedly, so it was just easier to hang him upside down over a bucket. Despite vomiting, the men rarely screamed. This is because the pain would be so physically overwhelming enough that it would affect his ability to even breathe. They would, however, thrash around wildly as each of the boys burst and then the cord was crunched. And don't worry, they would make a full day of torture out of this. Interesting to notice how usually these public spectacles drew crowds due to the lack of entertainment and also their intention to be a public spectacle. Well, unlike flayings or drownings or dismemberments where there's usually jeers and cheering, apparently with a good old sack squish, the crowds remained silent and shocked the whole time. Onlookers, male and female, are recorded to have vomited at the site. And now, a race for your life. This strange custom began in the 18th century and lasted well into the 19th. This custom only applied to viziers of the Sultan who committed a crime or were simply told they were being executed. It happened a lot, and for next to no reason. The official would be summoned to a meeting with the head gardener, and after exchanging greetings, the vizier would be handed a cup of sherbet. If it was white, then the Sultan had granted him life. If it was red, he was to be executed. As soon as he saw red sherbet, the vizier would start sprinting. Well, that's because the color red was the color of blood, and if the vizier wanted to keep it in his body, he could escape.
escape his fate by beating the head gardener, who moonlighted as the Ottomans executioner by the way, in a race through the palace gardens. The head gardener was honor bound to a foot race through the gardens to the place of execution near the fish market gate on the southern side of the palace, a distance of around 300 meters. If the vizier was able to finish the dash before the head gardener slash executioner, their sentence would be reduced from death to simple banishment. If the gardener was there, you might as well just keep running right off of a cliff. It isn't clear how this racing tradition got started, although one can speculate it was probably inspired by condemned individuals literally making the mad dash. The last man to save his neck by winning a life or death sprint was Grand Vizier Hakia Sahel Pasha in November of 1822. Hakia, whose predecessor had only lasted nine days in office before being executed, not only survived the death sentence, but was so widely esteemed for winning the race that he went on to be appointed the governor general of the province of Damascus. Yeah.